A fierce budget battle rages in Washington just as Obamacare begins to accept enrollees. To acquaint us with the latest from the Capitol and his plan to make Congress live under the health care law, we'll be joined by Louisiana Senator David Vitter. And later, Pope Francis's controversial interview of last week continues to send shockwaves through the Catholic and secular world. Ignatius Press publisher Father Joseph Fessio and Robert Royal of The Catholic Thing will tell us what the Pope really said and what it means to the future of the church. And finally, a story of redemption from racial hatred to rational love. Author Joseph Pierce discusses his journey and new memoir, Race with the Devil. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. We're delighted you decided to join us. Senator David Vitter, Father Joseph Fessio, Robert Royal, Joseph Pierce, and our 17th anniversary celebration are all straight ahead. As always, if you have a question or comment about tonight's show, you can tweet them to Raymond Arroyo or drop us an email at worldover at EWTN. Dot com. Lots to get to. First up, here's the brief news from the world over this week. There is anguish and fury in Kenya and Pakistan in the aftermath of jihadist attacks in those countries. In Nairobi on Saturday, terrorists stormed an upscale shopping mall, killing at least 72 during a four-day siege. According to survivors, the terrorists targeted non-Muslims, many of whom were tested on their knowledge of Islam. Those failing to answer basic questions were shot. Five terrorists were killed, according to the authorities. Another 11 were arrested. The al-Qaeda-linked group al-Shabaab, based in neighboring Somalia, claimed responsibility. The militant group threatened continued violence until Kenyan troops are removed from Somalia. And in Peshawar, Pakistan, 85 people were killed on Sunday as faithful left the city's historic Anglican church. Two suicide bombers detonated explosives inside the church and in an entryway. It was the deadliest attack ever on the already beleaguered Christian population there. Prayer vigils and protests have commenced throughout Pakistan. More than 2,000 outraged demonstrators stood outside the country's parliament demanding justice and protection for Christians. A Taliban group has claimed responsibility. Back here in Washington, it's an omnibus battle royale on Capitol Hill. This week, Republicans and Democrats are squabbling over the end of the month federal budget deadline, the October 1st implementation of the Affordable Care Act and the mid-October debt limit deadline. Earlier this week, Texas Senator Ted Cruz occupied the Senate well for 21 hours, urging the defunding of the Affordable Care Act. The House has already passed a government spending bill that would defund Obamacare, but the Senate's Democratic leadership means to strip out the defunding mechanism. Are the Democrats and Republicans willing to shut down the government over their Obamacare disagreement. We'll discuss it with Senator Vitter in our next segment. Meanwhile, the Little Sisters of the Poor have filed the first class action lawsuit against the Affordable Care Act's contraception mandate. The International Order of Sisters, whose sole mission is caring for the elderly, could face millions of dollars in IRS fines if they don't offer insurance coverage for contraceptives, sterilization, and abortifacient drugs. The nuns say that the Obama administration considers them not religious enough to receive a religious exemption from the mandate. The class action suit is among the more than 70 other legal challenges already filed against the mandate. And Christians have a surprising new ally in the fight against an increasingly secularized society, the president of Russia. 
During a speech to an international audience this past week, Vladimir Putin railed against the secularization of Europe while pledging to defend Russia's national identity based on religious values. Speaking to the Valdai group in Moscow, he said, many Euro-Atlantic countries have effectively embarked on a path of renouncing their roots, including Christian values, which underlie Western civilization. Policies are now pursued that put large families and same-sex partnerships in the same category, belief in God and belief in Satan. He added that this is a direct path to degradation and primitiveness to deep demographic and moral crises. Referring to Europe's falling pal population, he asked rhetorically, what can be a better indication of a moral crisis in human society than its loss of the ability for self-reproduction? And the Archdiocese of Melbourne, Australia, announced this week that Pope Francis has excommunicated and laicized a dissident Catholic priest who resigned recently his priesthood and founded a new congregation of, quote, inclusive Catholics. The former priest, Greg Reynolds, is an outspoken supporter of same-sex marriage and women's ordination. According to the archdiocese, he's, he was excommunicated for continuing to engage in ministry after his priestly faculties were suspended. And the head of the church's high court says U.S. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi should not be admitted to Holy Communion. Cardinal Raymond Burke of the Vatican's Apostolic Signatura told The Wanderer this week that given Pelosi's public position on abortion, church law must be applied. He said this is a person who obstinately, after repeated admonitions, persists in a grave sin, cooperating with the crime of procured abortion, and still professes to be a devout Catholic. Canon 950 of the Church's Code of Canon Law, prescri 915 rather of the Church's Code of Canon Law, prescribes that those who are obstinately perverse in manifest grave sin, if they persist in it, they're not to be admitted to Holy Communion. And a new day for the Church in Scotland. Archbishop Leo Cushley was installed as head of the Edinburgh Archdiocese this past weekend. He takes over for the former the leading prelate of Scotland, Cardinal Keith O'Brien, who resigned in February after public revelations of homosexual misconduct. Archbishop Cushley, who previously served as a top Vatican diplomat heading the English language section of the Holy See State Department, he now works closely, or did rather, with Pope Francis, and the Holy Father apparently personally asked him to take the Edinburgh Post. We wish him the best. When we return, the budget debate continues here in Washington. The, the Affordable Care Act is under fire, and a government shutdown looms. Louisiana Senator David Vitter is here to discuss all of it and more. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. My first guest is a senator from the great state of Louisiana, a member of the Senate Armed Services and Banking Committees, to give us his take on the looming government shutdown and the congressional exemption from Obamacare. Please welcome back to the program, Senator David Vitter. Thank you, great Raymond. To great to be back. here. Now, let's acquaint people with sure. what's happening. Right. The Obama administration has been extending these exemptions yep. to yep. big business, right. to uh, now small business. Right. Uh, they don't have to sign on to these uh, pools right. anymore. Yeah. If they get deferrals, why shouldn't everybody get a deferral? That's exactly right. And the most offensive exemption of all is for Congress. Special deal for Congress. They are putting this through in a draft rule that came out conveniently right after Congress left town to mm. flee the scene of the crime <laughs> early August. And it's completely contrary to the law, contrary uh, to statute. Tell us what it now. would do, because you have an amendment to heal this thing. Yeah, in the law, we actually, conservatives actually got in the Obamacare statute, surprisingly, uh, something that says every member of Congress, all congressional staff, have to go to the exchanges for their health care. Mm. Um, after it was passed, it was sort of a case of what Nancy Pelosi said. We have to pass a law in order to figure out what's in it. Mm. People read that here on Capitol Hill and said, 
oh my goodness, we have to fix this. Uh -huh. And so there was scurrying around, and sure enough, President Obama got a rule issued that said, well, not quite. Uh, and he changed some things, including for those members and staff who do go to the exchange, they get to take a huge taxpayer-funded subsidy with them, which is unavailable to every other American at those income levels going to the exchange. That's made up out of thin air. That's not in the statute. That's without authority. And so I have a provision to nix that. Hmm. Where is it now? How much support have you received? Uh, it's growing support. Uh, you know, the key is getting a vote because mm -hmm. a lot of members are grousing about it behind the scenes. Uh -huh. When a vote happens, that's different, and we're going to get a lot of votes. So I'm fighting for a vote, and there is a possibility that the House leadership and the House Republicans could put it in the next iteration of the CR. Uh, CR was the continuing resolution yeah, the that funds, the, funds the government. Right. Now, Dick Durbin your colleague in the Senate, yeah. he says by eliminating, you, what you're really doing is eliminating the employer-provided contributions to health care. And that therefore... For Congress For Congress and, and their staff. Right. And that you are, you are throwing these poor people on Capitol Hill onto these exchanges. And why would you do such a thing? Well, first of all, I'm not doing that. The law did that, that he voted for and I voted against. Mm -hmm. I'm saying maybe we should live by the law and not make up things as we go along contrary to the statute. Mm -hmm. So that's his statute, his Obamacare law, mm -hmm. that does that. The reason I think we should do it is I think Congress and congressional staff, and by the way, I would include the president, vice president, all their political appointees, should walk in the shoes of ordinary Americans, mm -hmm. should feel the experience that 8 million Americans are feeling who are going to the exchanges against their will, who had good health care, heard the president say, if you like uh, the health care you have, you can keep it, and then found out that was a lie for them. Mm. Yeah, because many people, sure. small businesses and, and yeah. some big businesses, are realizing we can't keep up with this. Right. Let everybody go to the exchanges. Yeah, there's so, a built-in financial incentive for employers to dump their employees into the exchanges. It's far cheaper mm. for companies to do that than to keep their health care. So there's a built-in incentive to push people to that exchange. But here's the problem. These exchanges aren't ready. No. I mean, the, no. the, the, the administration's giving waivers hand over fist. Yeah. How can you compel people this Tuesday right. to right. get on an exchange that is not set up to receive you? Right. Well, I think most Americans are figuring out, you know, whatever you think about Obamacare, love it, hate it, whatever you think, it is not ready for prime time. Mm. And prime time starts October 1st. And it is not ready for prime time. So what's the restorative here? What's the healing device that Congress is prepared to put into place? Uh, do you see a year deferral? I mean, well, I know there's some talk in the House of attaching that to this funding bill. That could be on the funding bill. And Senator Joe Manchin, a Democrat today, mm -hmm. said he would support a one-year delay of the individual exemption. That's different from the whole bill, mm -hmm. but that's still a big delay. Mm -hmm. One-year delay of the individual exemption to match the delay, uh, individual mandate, mandate, excuse me, to match the delay of the employer mandate. Ah. Uh, Ted Cruz, who famously took to the floor for yeah. his 21-hour stand-up yeah. this week, yeah. uh, educating the country country about yeah. Obamacare and apparently the finer points of Dr. Seuss, um, <laughs> mentions that he would like to broaden the Vitter Amendment yeah. to include not only congressional staff, right. but all federal employees, make right. all federal employees subject right. to the health care bill. Yeah. What's wrong with that? Well, I disagree with that for two reasons. First of all, I think we should focus on the policymakers in Washington who came up with this monstrosity. Mm. Congress, congressional staff who wrote it president, vice president, political appointees. Mm -hmm. I think that group of people is far different than a postal worker in Nebraska, mm -hmm. than uh, somebody in an agency in middle America. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, as a practical matter, uh, that I'm not saying this is Ted's motive, but yeah. that's a sure way to kill the amendment. Uh -huh. Every Democrat will vote against that amendment. Uh, it is an easy call politically for every Democrat because federal employees are such an important constituency. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that's Ted's motive, but that right. will kill the amendment and preserve this special exemption for Congress. So your point is, let's get Congress and its staff to get their skin in the game, yeah. and then we can affect some change. Absolutely. Don't, don't Absolutely. throw the net so wide I think right the now. quicker Washington is treated just like America under Obamacare, the quicker we're going to fix some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, 
there has been some resistance among the Democratic leadership yes, toward this I amendment. I would say that's putting it lightly. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, to, uh, to out and out targeting of you, yeah. there was talk, public talk, Senator Reid, yeah. saying that he was drafting an amendment that would exempt anyone who's taken part in uh, unbecoming uh, behavior in the past and that it would deny those members subsidies under this health care plan. Right. The idea there is that he's targeting you. Yeah, absolutely. You filed a complaint with the Senate Ethics yeah. Committee on yeah. this. They threw the complaint away. Yeah. Well, I refiled today, and so okay. they're going to have to look at it because it's a very substantive complaint. That complaint is actually about another great amendment idea Reed and Company had. They didn't just have this idea. They drafted it in formal legislative language. They used taxpayer resources on this idea. And this other amendment said, you know, if anybody supports the Vitter Amendment, no Washington exemption from Obamacare, then you lose your subsidy immediately, whether it passes or not. So in other words, con member of Congress, Senator, you're going to be compensated differently depending on how you vote. If you vote with us, you get more compensation. If you vote with Vitter, you get less compensation. That is flat out prohibited under the rules, and that's a very substantive ethics complaint that I'm going to pursue. When the Senate Ethics Committee threw your first complaint out, yeah. they said, this amendment is not on paper. It never was moved yeah. uh, to the floor. So what's your beef? Yeah. Well, uh, it was on paper. We don't have the paper yet. Reporters have it. They told us they're looking at it. It's technical language. Taxpayer resources were clearly mm -hmm. used to draft so there was it. It was an intention discussed. to move it forward. Absolutely. Now, your colleague, Barbara Boxer, whom you serve with on the environmental committee, yeah. said using the ethics committee to launch a political attack, she, she can't believe that that's what you're doing. Is that what you're doing? No, I'm filing a very substantive ethics complaint. Mm -hmm. Look, if she thinks it's fine to promote an amendment that says you're going to be paid differently depending on how you vote, I think she should explain that because mm -hmm. that's uh, really a problem. Uh, I just want to get you on two quick points. Sure. The president of Iran this yeah. week appeared at the UN. He says all nuclear devices should be destroyed. He's a man of peace. And the president has come out. He's got uh, John Kerry meeting with uh, his colleague on the other side, on the Iranian side. Do you see any positive developments coming out of no, that No, I'm really concerned, quite frankly, that this Iranian has been trading notes with the Syrians and they have figured out rope dope how to play this administration along and meanwhile guess what's happening in Iran their nuclear program is moving every hour every day every week mm. and in Syria we're learning today the freedom fighters that yeah. we were that we're arming yeah. that we're sending support toward yeah. many of the western aligned freedom fighters the rebels are leaving the country yes. and al-Qaeda operatives are doubling down and yes. moving in. Is yeah. that a concern? And is there big any... That's a big concern oh. of the American people. Where's the Senate on this? Yeah, well, um, you know, the, the president isn't asking for a vote anymore because mm -hmm. I think he knows he would lose it. Yeah. But that's a big concern of the American people. All of us know what is happening in Syria is horrible. The, the, the challenge is what can we do positively about it and do we want to send arms to who knows whom? Yeah. Senator David Vitter, thank thanks so much Raymond, for being very here. Much. We'll see you again soon. Thanks. When we return, Pope Francis's words are making waves once again. And Father Joseph Fessio of Ignatius Press and the president of the Faith and Reason Institute, Robert Royal, joins us to decode them. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. For two weeks now, the world's media has been exploding with stories excerpting Pope Francis's lengthy interview with an Italian Jesuit magazine. From his thoughts on church governance to abortion to same-sex marriage, the Pope's words have caused a frenzy. Many have reported that the Pope is changing the church or relaxing doctrine. What did Pope Francis actually say? And has church teaching been altered in a nod to the times? Here to analyze Francis's words and the fallout is the founder and editor of Ignatius Press, Father Joseph Fessio. He joins us via satellite from San Francisco and the president of the Faith and Reason Institute here in Washington and a member of the illustrious Conclave crew 
Mr. Robert Royal. Gentlemen, thank you both Great for being be here. here. Again. I want to start with, I want to quote the Pope. He talked about doctrinal balance at one point in this long 12,000 word interview. Here's what he said. The dogmatic and moral teachings of the church are not all equivalent. The church's pastoral ministry cannot be obsessed with the transmission of a disjointed multitude of doctrines to be imposed insistently. Proclamation in a missionary style focuses on the essentials, on the necessary things. This is also what fascinates and attracts more, what makes the heart burn, as it did for the disciples at Emmaus. We have to find a new balance. Otherwise, even the moral edifice of the church is likely to fall like a house of cards, losing the freshness and fragrance of the gospel. Robert Royal, your reaction to that line? Many say this is the Pope chiding, telling the church you've become obsessed with these little, what he called, small-minded rules, and it's time for a new balance. Well, I mean, given this statement in its totality, I, I think he's exactly right that we need our evangelical thrust, a new freshening up of the gospel. But the thing that worries me about this way of putting it, and of course it's been re repeated over and over again in the press that we can't insist, we can't obsess. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, who wants to obsess and who wants to insist on, on things? We, the thing that bothers me, and I hear this from, uh, pastorally from a number of priests and others, is that they feel that they've been doing this. That ever since Vatican II, we, we've been, talked a lot about God's love, about the saving power of, of the gospel. And that actually the balance that was restored began to be restored with John Paul and, and Benedict, that those moral principles that had kind of been lost to the spirit of Vatican II were being added back into that proclamation of, of, of salvation. So mm -hmm. for me, I, I'm worried that we're actually we're going in the opposite direction, that we're starting to start an, an, another imbalance. I've called it the spirit of Bergoglio, as you know, in a, in a column that I oh. wrote, where his actual words don't matter, that oh. people get this impression that all that stuff now is it's off the table it's secondary it's 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 later it's all love mm -hmm. love 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 and, and mercy and uh, I, I think that that's that's not what he intends but it's what a lot of people have heard hmm. uh, father Fessio do you see a shift here I mean certainly there is an emphasis that is changing if not doctrine you have Bishop Vasha today of uh, Santa Rosa who said um, I certainly do not know who these individuals are these people who are obsessed obsessed with these uh, with abortion and 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 uh, and marriage he said now maybe I'm one of the obsessed people what do you think father first of all Raymond uh, notice in the New York Times headline quote that obsessed was the only thing in quotes right and it, the headline said Pope says church obsessed with gays abortion and birth control well, Pope didn't say that at all so I think Bob is right that some people took it wrong I think the New York Times purposely takes it wrong but I was blissfully at 10,200 feet in the High Sierra when this happened, knowing nothing about it. And I came back and heard about the brouhaha, kind of like Moses coming down from the mountain hearing all the noise. <laughs> and so I uh, first read the interview, which was 27 pages long in my printout, yeah. and noticed that the controversial part was less than 1% of that. Mm -hmm. But as I read that interview, I thought, this is beautiful, it's balanced, it's clear. It will be misunderstood by many, but what he says is true. And Raymond, here's how I would sum up the interview in four words. Quaerens me se distilasus. Those are from the Dies Irae. It refers to Jesus at the well in Samaria. Samaria was the area of the heretics, the mm -hmm. Samaritans. And who comes to Jesus but a woman who is a prostitute and an adulteress. And Jesus' first words are not, you've broken the commandments, you're a heretic, and you're immoral, but no, rather, give me something to drink that intrigues this woman. Why are you talking to me? You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan, and I'm a woman. And he says, if you knew I was talking to you, to ask for water, I'd give you something you'd never thirst for again. Give me that water, sir. So you see the dynamic there? That's the dynamic of Pope Francis. That's the dynamic of Jesus, of opening a dialogue, entering into the lives of these people, having mercy on them, but waiting for them, going on the periphery, as the Pope says, and then engaging them, and then bringing the moral consequences to the meaning of love. That's what Jesus did. I think that's what the Pope is doing. By the way, I think he's in total continuity with John Paul II and with Benedict. The difference is personality. He's got a different personality. 
he's reaching out pastorally in a way that John Paul II and Benedict set the foundations for. Uh, Pope Benedict, by the way, in 2006 said Catholicism isn't a collection of prohibitions. It is a positive option. So there is a, there is a tendency, I think, to try to create this narrative. And in the press, you've seen this, where there's the doctrinaire, rigid Benedict, and then the loving, merciful Francis, when indeed they are sort of parroting each other. But again, the emphasis is there is no doubt and Father Fessio, I'm going to come back to you in a second. Uh, Robert Royal, there is no doubt that this has caused a, I can only describe it as a chaotic reaction. If you read my email, there are half the people who say, this is wonderful, I, I feel reborn. There's another half of, of the, the email correspondence that says, I'm confused, I'm upset, I'm outraged. Where, where is that? Where, how much of that is the fault of the, the viewer, and how much of that is the fault of the Pope? I think there's definitely language in this interview. I, I agree with Father Fessio that this is the constant message of the church anyway. Mm -hmm. that you reach centers, I mean, you, you reach another person. You don't start by telling them about all their faults. Right, wagging you, your finger you, 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 you begin by engaging them and you develop a relationship over time. Mm -hmm. But there are phrases here. There, there are phrases when, when he says, for example, um, uh, not everything in Catholicism is on the same plane, which is, is, is of course, true. Right. Uh, Benedict and the bishops of the United States for many years tried to argue that uh, the, the pro-life message, for example, is not the same as various other Washington uh, policy questions. And so we know that there, there is a structure here. But it seems to me that in a number of places, he, uh, I, I think he makes a rhetorical slip. He gives people a chance to misinterpret him. It's a, sort of an unforced error, as you say in mm -hmm. baseball. It didn't have to be that way, but mm -hmm. some of the language lends itself to that. Mm. L let's look at this. Uh, this is a, a, a portion of the interview that's been getting a lot of coverage, some of it confusing, maliciously so, on the part of some in the media. Here it is. Uh, he talks about abortion and contraception and gay marriage. We cannot insist only on issues related to abortion, gay marriage, and the use of contraceptive methods. This is not possible. I've not sm spoken much about these things, and I was reprimanded for that. But when we speak about these issues, we have to talk about them in context. The teaching of the church, for that matter, is clear. And I am a son of the church. But it is not necessary to talk about these issues all the time. Your reaction, Father Fessio? Well, I agree wholeheartedly with him. But as a matter of fact, the very next day, uh, after this appeared in Civita Catolica, he gave a talk to the gynecologist saying that abortion was a terrible evil and every child who's been aborted has, has the face of Christ on him. And then a couple of days later, he agreed upon to the excommunication of a priest in Australia who had been promoting gay rights. So he does talk about these things, but just not all the time. And that was all he said. He says we can't only talk about these things. And you know something which I think is great? But Randy, Father Fessio, who's that, only talking about these things? Well, that's the point. You see, I have to explain this to you folks. He's a Jesuit. He's an old-time <laughs> Jesuit. They are shrewd, okay? The word Jesuitical means something. Mm -hmm. uh, what has he got? What's, what's he done? He's got the whole world talking about this. He's got Raymond Roy talking about this. He's got Bob Royal on the show. They bring in Father Fessio. Everybody's watching these things. Well, maybe someone's going to read what he said and see, that's beautiful, that's profound. When he says at the end, I pick up my breviary in Latin and say it every day, and I make an hour's adoration for the Sacrament at night, maybe they'll hear that. But you know something? The people, it's a head fake, basically, and he's faked out some of the liberals because now they're listening. Even Narol, you know, puts in an ad saying, thank you, Pope. Well, maybe that sense of gratitude in some of those people will make them listen to something. It'll be the first step towards actually hearing something he's saying. So I think this is a beautiful Jesuit, Jesuitical talk. And I'm, I looks like he caught you guys, too, by surprise. He didn't catch me by surprise. <laughs> Robert Royal, uh, your reaction to that. Um, when you have Hans Kung, Nayral, John Cornwell saying, this is a great new day, this pope is breaking new ground, does that give you comfort? <sighs> Father, it's too bad we're separated by the entire country because we could have a long talk about this. Like, I, I just think that when you start using terms like insisting and obsessing, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't really help 
a conversation because what it sounds like you're doing is you're criticizing, I agree with you, I don't know who he's criticizing, but it sounds like you're criticizing people who are fervent Catholics mm. and you're, uh, you're giving people who, who oppose the church's teaching and out to say, you know, even John, like even uh, Pope Francis has told you guys to stop yapping about this all the mm -hmm. time. And, you know, they're not entirely wrong. So there, there's an, un, it seems to me that there's a, a rhetoric here that is unfortunate. If I were, uh, if Pope Francis called me, I'm not holding my breath for this to happen, mm -hmm. but if he did call me, I would, t I, I would give him as my first advice not to use those words again, insisting and obsessing, because mm -hmm. they, they really kind of insult people who have, in some cases, paid in their personal lives mm -hmm. to be pro-life, to oppose gay marriage uh, and, and all these other hot-button issues. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I, I don't think, Father, frankly, that Neral is likely to hear the gospel and repent because of some uh, nice words coming out of Rome. But, but wait a minute. Uh, Keith, you are putting a hermeneutic a rupture on this thing. The Pope says something, and you're applying these this language to people you think it doesn't deserve to be applied to. But that's an interpretation. Why not give a hermeneutic of continuity? Why not read this document in continuity with the Jewish tradition with John Paul II and Benedict? I mean, basically, you're falling in the same trap that the anti-Vatican II people do. Mm. You, you're, you're applying this to people it's not necessarily applying to. Why not give the Pope the benefit of the doubt? Robert Royal? I, I think you're, you're applying a hermeneutic to me that I didn't, I just didn't <laughs> use, Father. I'm not saying that there's, any, there's not any rupture. I don't think there's any rupture whatever in terms of the theological doctrine, in terms of morals. But I, what I'm talking about is a rhetoric that quite clearly has made a number of Catholics unhappy and worried and quite clearly has given some comfort to people who don't particularly like Catholicism. And that has to be factored into. I think when the, the Holy Father speaks from Rome about uh, important issues, that's one dimension of how he speaks, which goes to the, 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 the question of what he's actually mm -hmm. saying. And Janet so you Smith, don't think, Jan you don't Father, think Catholics should be made uncomfortable? Well, they, I think there are a lot of uncomfortable Catholics this week. Janet Smith uh, has written a, a long piece, and she, you know, it it feels wounded, I think, by the approach here. And again, I, I boil it down to this selection of language. It seems a question of prudence rather than continuity. Or There's no breach in continuity. I agree with you, Father Fessio. I want to I share this line with you, though. This is uh, Hadley Arks, uh, who writes in The Catholic Thing, which Rob edits, uh, and it said, Bob edits, and it says, the teaching on abortion has been a teaching of natural law and uh, a weave of embryology and moral reasoning. And then he points out that the Pope came out Friday, as you did, Father Fessio, to medical professionals. The Pope affirmed the teaching on abortion, grounded in science and moral reasoning, and Ark, Ark says, but I'm afraid that the refined corrections and restatements may no longer matter. For a deeper sign has been given, and many people are now confident with a telling wink that they know what the Pope, quote, really means. That sense of things promises to run deeper than the clarifications bound to come. Is that a danger in your mind, Father Fessio? Uh, it is a danger, and this Pope is one who's not afraid of danger. And I agree with Bob Royal. This is a prudential decision that can be made. But... I also think that Phil Lawler had the right point when he said, look, the Pope made us uncomfortable. We should be examining ourselves, making sure we're not being narrow-minded and we're not mm -hmm. being, you know, too one-sided on this thing. But the fact is, uh, he's, he's made a beautiful statement, and uh, I'm happy he, he made it. I'm with the Pope on this one. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree that a lot of good Catholics don't have the same view on this, but I do think it's caught the attention of the non-Catholic world and the fallen away Catholic world, and those are the ones that need to hear something. Yeah, I also think a lot of Catholics haven't read it in totality, which is something that uh, I would encourage everybody to do, because in, to in its totality, it is not nearly as inflammatory as it is when you read it in little excerpts or headlines from the New York Times. I, 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 I agree with that. And he also says the proclamation of salvation is, is the first movement, then moral and religious imperatives. That's not a exactly. bad chemistry, is it? No, in fact, it's a good imagery. Well, you know, I, again, I want to say that, that uh, for, for the three of us and for lots of other people probably watching us, uh, we're going to hear this in one fashion. Mm -hmm. But it's clear that it's what, what's happened in the world at large. And, you know, I would say that anybody who, who speaks in public knows that the, it's a, there's a difference between stating something and communicating it. In, in the world at large, people are going to hear this language as saying, yeah, 
you know, you got to love Jesus. We love you. Jesus loves you. We love each other. Mm -hmm. and, and that stuff is further down the line. And, and it may be further down the line to the point that you never get to it. Let me get to this because we only have two more minutes and I want to get, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. He, uh, the Pope's mentioning of homosexuality in the interview. He said, in Buenos Aires, I used to receive letters from homosexual persons who are socially wounded because they tell me that they feel like the church has always condemned them. But the church does not want to do this. During the return flight from Rio de Janeiro, I said that if a homosexual person is of good will and is in search of God, I'm no one to judge. By saying this, I said that the cat what the catechism says, religion has the right to express its opinion in the service of the people, but God in creation has set us free. It is not possible to interfere spiritually in the life of a person. Father Fessio, your reaction? Well, in this one, I would agree with Bob. In a 27-page document, this, I thought, was phrased imperfectly and perhaps even translated imperfectly. I don't know. This wasn't the original language in English. I, I looked at the but, translation, by the way. I looked at the original Italian, by the way. It's not, it's not mistranslated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then uh, the thing is, I, I mean, I think that could have, could have better stated. But again, Ignatius in the Spiritual Exercises says whenever you're in a discussion with someone, you always try and put the best interpretation on his words. And what he's saying here is it's in the catechism. We have to respect every human being, homosexual, heterosexual, sinner or saint, mm -hmm. as being human persons that God loves. So there's nothing new there. Mm -hmm. Phrasing, he's not a Benedict, okay? <laughs> and I think Nicole Winfield got this right for AP. She said... There's nothing new and no change in doctrine here, but there's a change in tone and emphasis. Mm -hmm. Well, do we want uniformity in tone and emphasis? Is that important? I think it's good to have these kind of changes. But, I, you mm -hmm. know, I, I would agree that could have been, could have been said better. Mm -hmm. Robert? Well, I think that this phrase is the most problematic in, in the entire interview. Mm -hmm. And it, what it, it, I think the way people... I agree. People, I, I think, agree. I, 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 the way people could interpret yeah, the way, it. Yeah, the way people are going to hear it. And actually what it actually says is the church cannot interfere. It, it, it cannot... Uh, it offers an opinion and it cannot interfere in people's spiritual lives. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, in the right. sense of, you know, can it impose this on you? Can it force you? Yeah. That, I, I think what's confused there is he's trying to say people are free, they have to come to God freely, mm -hmm. and that, that we therefore have to have that respect for that God-given mm -hmm. freedom. But what it says, and I think what it will be universally taken to mean, is the church just proposes this stuff and, you know, you've got your own spiritual life, it's you and God, and we, and we know that that's the modern, sort of the modern tendency to heresy is just to assume all institutions are utterly unimportant. It's just me and Jesus mm -hmm. and we make up our own minds about what we believe, how we're going to act, mm -hmm. what we think is moral and immoral. And this, of course, is, is yeah. uh, it's a disaster if people go down that route. Uh, I, I want to give you all both a crack at this before we go. Father Fessio, in Rio, the Pope said and encouraged young people to make a mess out there in the secular world, that that's what they were called to. I, I wrote a column at the time saying, in some ways, Pope Francis is making his own mess, and he wants to stir things up. He wants people engaged, as you said earlier, to refocus on this eternal message. Is that such a bad thing? Or when you articulate doctrine in this way, does it lead to more confusion than clarity? Well, let's not be papalatrists here. I mean, he's talking off the cuff. He's talking in an not this interview, but on the plane or whatever. I mean, he's going to make a few remarks that are going to be odd. So let, let him be a human being and make his own mistakes. But I think overall, his general tendency is concern for the poor, uh, mm -hmm. his desire to get out of the periphery. Th these are all wonderful things. And the fact is, he is totally doctrinally orthodox. I mean, there's no, we're not going to see any changes in the church's tradition under this pope. No, no, I agree, and I think, and I think if, if we had your Jesuit training, Father, and everybody did, it would be easy to interpret it. I think it's the pull quotes that make this so troubling, and uh, the way it's being spun in the larger media. Yeah, and, and, Robert, and I think word. at the end of the day, I agree entirely with Father. We're not going to hear anything heterodox, heretical from this pope. No. There's going to be no change in Catholic moral teaching, whatever. But we have the example of the spirit of Vatican II, mm. where it didn't matter what the document said, it didn't matter what authorities told us that it said, a certain spirit gets going and then no one can kind of get a grip on it. Mm. And so my fear, and it, right now I think we're only at the beginning of it and maybe the, the Pope is finding his way to be a Pope and, and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. My fear though mm -hmm. is if this starts to get away from him, 
I'm not sure that he can ever get it back. If, if you have people in parishes, if you have priests reporting this, if you have children saying that the Pope is saying it's okay to be gay or it's okay to have an abortion, uh, that in itself is leading people into temptation. So we have to hope that he and his team in Rome are going to find a more disciplined, uh, you know, less lurid way to enter into the, these public conversations. Very good. And we will leave it there. Robert Royal, Father Joseph Fessio, thank you both for being with us. You can find out more of Robert's columns at thecatholicthing.org and Ignatius Press is always at ignatius.com. When we return, Catholic author Joseph Pierce's story of faith and redemption told in his new memoir, Race with the Devil, My Journey from Racial Hatred to Rational Love. The World Over Live continues in just a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. He's the author of nearly 20 books and has become one of the top literary biographers of our time. He's examined the lives of G.K. Chesterton, C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, to name just a few. But this time, he examines the life of another author himself. From fascist revolutionary to committed Catholic and scholar, We've heard only fragments of this story before, but now he's committed it to paper. Here to discuss his new and revealing memoir, Race with the Devil, My Journey from Racial Hatred to Rational Love, is Joseph Pierce. Joseph, thanks for coming back it's on the show. Now, you've mentioned little bits of this story over the years, but I have to tell you, reading this book, this is a little like reading Stephen King. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, there's some horror here around the edges. Tell me, let's start with your father. Um, he, you, you paint a very complex picture of this man, a man whom you admired and then in many ways you're, you are repulsed by. Uh, tell me about what he taught you, certainly to, to hate the Catholic Church as well as the Irish, and how that led you to this fascist... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that I had a very loving relationship with my father. My father was very loving towards me. This makes the whole thing complex and complicated mm. because he taught me good things. He taught me history, taught me poetry. Yeah. Um, but he also taught me, you know, to be very sort of jingoistic about British imperialism, very racist, very anti-Catholic. And, of course, you know, I, I, I learned all that at my father's knee, and, and it really mm. took a lot to, to get beyond that. Mm. And tell me, you, you fall in not only to sort of a neo-Nazi phase, you also become an Orangeman, which <laughs> surprised me. Explain to our American and, and non-English viewers and Irish viewers what that means. Well, the Orange Order is a secret society. Uh, it's an anti-Catholic secret society that exists only to oppose uh, the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So for an orange man to become a Catholic is actually an extremely unusual phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I'll say. Now, tell me, let, let's walk people through a little of this journey. This did not happen in a thunderbolt. It does not happen all at once, but very gradually. There's one point in the story where uh, a girl takes you to the Catholic Mass. Tell me about that moment. Yeah, I was about 10 years old, and I was very anti-Catholic, and she was, God knows why a 10-year-old girl wants to become a Catholic, but she had this in her head, and she took me around and showed me the statues, and I felt a real presence there, which, of course, I could not articulate or understand. Mm -hmm. But, of course, it, with the wisdom of hindsight, looking back, because I went to the Anglican churches, and they might be more beautiful aesthetically, but there was an emptiness there, an absence, and there was something in the Catholic Church, and that sort of it was there subliminally, and, of course, later on, when I started approaching the Catholic church, it came back to me as a revelation. Mm. Tell, me, tell me about what was happening to you outside of this. Um, you were pulled into this sort of fascist political, the National Front, um, this organization, very radical. You start editing The Bulldog, a newspaper, a magazine, in 1977 for young people, to pull young people into this uh, mode of thought. What was driving you? I mean, beyond your father's uh, tutelage, what was driving you to continue this and want to propagate it and pass it on to others? Well, by this stage, you know, I'd become a white supremacist. I uh, looked down on, on non-whites, saw them as being inferior, and I believed with the National Front that all non-whites should be removed from the United Kingdom by force, mm. uh, compulsorily. Uh, and consequently, I, I was full of hatred, and the Bull Bulldog magazine I launched to be the paper of the Young National Front to try to get teenagers like me, I was 16 when I launched that magazine, to get them to join, to join the party. Wow. And, and w when you look back on this, and was there any hesitation 
about revealing the depth. I mean, I have to tell you, I was sort of taken aback by not only how long you were part of this, but the depths of this. Did you worry that this might cast a pall over the work you've done over these last decade, the last decade or so? Well, I certainly believe that if you have a, if you have a skeleton in your cupboard, you either you know, hide it and then spend the rest of your life in fear, mm -hmm. or you take it out and rattle it in front of everybody and say, look, this is it, and you know, take a look at it, and there you are. You know, but I must confess, I, I delayed writing it for a long while, not because I was worried about my own reputation, but because it was very, very close to home, uh -huh. psychologically, emotionally, mm -hmm. my parents, everything else. I, I needed enough time to be... Uh, objective, and uh, it's taken me this long, if you like, to get that distance that was necessary to tell the story. Now, tell people, during your second incarceration, something happens when you are in jail. Tell me about that. Well, I was sent... Uh, first of all, when, I, when, when you're processed to go into prison, they ask you what your religion is. And I wasn't expecting a question, and they asked you what my religion was, and I thought for a moment and said, Catholic. And then immediately I thought, what have I just said? Mm -hmm. You know, because I wasn't a Catholic, of yeah. course. And then the next day, you know, I had these rosary beads that someone had given me, and I was very opposed to rosary beads. As an orange man, we sang songs attacking... Uh, someone in court gave it to you. Someone in court gave it to me, and my father called Catholics disparagingly bead rattlers. So I was very opposed to the rosary beads, but now I wanted to say them. And, of course, I couldn't say them because I didn't know any of the prayers, you know, the Hail Mary or the Glory Be or the Apostles' Creed. Mm -hmm. But I had this great desire to pray, and I just mumbled inarticulate prayers and fumbled the beads. And all I can say is that was the first time I've ever prayed, and answers started flooding in, healing started flooding in, and I began to attend Mass in prison during that second prison sentence. Wow. Now, it, curiously enough, it is Chesterton's economic theory that really drew you to the intellectual part of the Catholic Church, and I guess to Chesterton himself, whom you would later write a landmark biography of. Tell yeah. me about that moment. Well, basically, you know, I, I hated the Catholic Church, of course, so nothing would induce me to read a, a book about Catholicism. But I was interested in, in alternatives to, if you like, uh, communism and uh, corporate globalism, mm -hmm. multinational uh, running of the world, the Bill Gates, uh, big business and big government mm -hmm. uniting. So I was looking for alternatives, and someone said, have you read the, the, of the economic ideas of Chesterton? And I hadn't. So I, I, I started reading Chesterton's economic ideas, but then fell in love with everything else he was writing. <laughs> so over a period of time, of course, reading more and more Chesterton, and then Belloc and C.S. Lewis and John Henry Newman, eventually Thomas Aquinas. I mean, you know, I was, I was on the way. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating the way, as you read this story, it isn't any big monumental moment. It's tiny little things. It's someone giving you a rosary bead. It's coming across Chesterton. Then there are three people you meet that sort of confirm the direction your life is now taking. Tell us about those three instances. Yeah, acts of love, basically, by people that I that I would consider to be enemies. In, in particular, there was a, there was a I was anti-Semitic as well, and mm -hmm. there was a Jewish civil rights lawyer, sort of in the UK equivalent of the ACLU, mm -hmm. and I was convinced that he hated me. But I went there anyway to demand my rights because I'd been basically me and others, um, myself and others, had, had been uh, abused. Our rights had been abused, and I expected to basically tell me to go away. And I, I really just went for the satisfaction of being able to tell him he's a hypocrite because he mm -hmm. believes in civil liberties for yeah. people he agrees with, but not for people he disagrees with. But this man agreed that uh, the police should not have been able to uh, imprison me illegally and, and such like, and I was astonished. And then, when his colleagues refused to defend me because of my politics, he resigned his job. So this man, who was an enemy, you know, put his principles uh, in, into practice by literally sacrificing his own position for me. And it's acts of love such as this mm. uh, that, that, that actually speak very loudly. And I'm aware now that, really, if we want to convert the culture, we have to do our best to basically become saints. And I know it's easier said than done, mm. but that has to be the way it's done. We have to love people. Yeah, sounds like Pope Francis with his... You have to heal the wounds, he keeps saying. Heal the wounds with mercy. That's... It's very interesting because as I was reading the book, I just read this 12,000-word interview with him, and I'd been digesting it over and over for the earlier segment. Uh, and when I picked up your book again, that really is the, the, the through line here, is that it's that, those merciful acts that really do draw you closer to the church and... and yeah, if, and if you're surrounded by a shell of bigotry, a shell of hatred, the only thing that's going to penetrate it ultimately is not reason but love. And it was those moments of love that actually penetrated and let me open then to pursue the rational path. Why did you write this book now? And who did you intend this book for? 
Well, I, th I think it's a powerful story. I, th I, I, of course, as a convert, find conversion stories very powerful. I've been specializing in them, mm -hmm. the conversion of Chesterton and others. So I'm hoping it will be a witness, will bring others to, to the Catholic Church. Um, I think it's a powerful story, and it does show that someone's a neo-Nazi, uh, a racist, an anti-Semite, very anti-Catholic, mm -hmm. and can be drawn to the Catholic Church. No one is beyond the reach of the love of God, and everybody is reachable. And I think that's what I hope my, my book will convey and, and, and give hope to people. Joseph Peter. Thank you so much for being here My and pleasure. for the book. It was quite a read. Joseph Pierce is co-editor of the literary journal, The St. Austin Review. You can check it out at staustinreview.com. His new memoir, Race with the Devil, My Journey from Racial Hatred to Rational Love, is available at bookstores everywhere and, of course, through the EWTN Religious Catalog. And finally, our 17th anniversary celebration comes to a close this week. I know you're sad. I thought we'd bring you some highlights from some of the legends of stage and screen who've appeared on the show over the years. So many great people. Ricardo Montalban, Patricia Heaton, Dom DeLuise, Carol O'Connor in his last television interview. Tim Conway, Jim Caviezel, Anthony Hopkins, Hugh Jackman. I could go on, but I won't. They're not only great performers, but great people. Take a look. You said the single most difficult job of your career was playing Mr. Rourke. Why did you say that? The thing that was difficult about it was that if you ask any actor what is the most difficult thing to do is exposition, <laughs> where you set the stage for somebody okay. else. In, in Fancy Island, I couldn't become involved emotionally. I couldn't express any kind of strong emotions because I was the perfect host. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Fantasy Hyde. Smiles, everyone, Smiles, I remember. Right. <laughs> Therefore, who is that boss? Well, that's me, so and so. That's her fantasy boss. <laughs> well, her fantasy is that when she was a child, her mother took away a little doll, and then and then the little doll has become a symbol of the love of her mother, and the mother is dead, and she would like to be able to get the little doll again. You see, now that is very uninteresting to say. You cannot, you know, you've got fascinating to, for the audience, difficult as an actor. Well, because you have to, or the, the audience can go, <sighs> unless you imbue it with interest, uh, vitality, mm -hmm. a little inventiveness. Ah. You cannot lampoon the character you're playing. You cannot be aware that he's funny as an actor. You have to play him intensely, and you have to play him fiercely and angrily, and that's what makes him funny. David, will you look at me standing here? Will you look at that poor face on me here? How many times did I beg your hands and knees, never use my razor? If you could write for me the final line of the Carol O'Connor story, what would that line be? Think of me kindly, friends. I didn't mean it. <laughs> you have the ability to turn on a dime, and there are very few actresses that have the facility you mm. have to be in the midst of a comedic moment mm. and turn to pathos mm. in a heartbeat. Mm. How do you do that? How do you work? Because the, the comedy it comes out of pain. I mean, most of the situations, if you look at it, that we do on the show, are very funny, but they're extremely painful for the people involved. Mm -hmm. So, and that's why I think you find a lot of comedians have very difficult backgrounds, and the way they deal with it uh, is to be funny and to entertain. In fact... Is that how you deal with it? Um, well, I just happen to be terribly gifted. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us about Dominic the Great. Well, he, he's, um, he's a built-in failure who thinks he's doing very well. He's very serious. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dominic the Great, and I am the greatest magician in the whole world. And then he would make fire, and he would burn his head. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to do a nice Italian trick. The people up front are going to be fascinated. The one in the back. <laughs> So when I was baptized, it was Greek Orthodox, and they put you on a little uh, platform. The, uh, the priest walks around, and they hold on to a praying cloth kind of thing, and they walk around, and uh, uh, everybody is praying and everything. And since I was so old, because normally you're a couple weeks old, you're not going to go anywhere, but I was about six months before I was baptized. So as they're walking around, I had fallen off the uh, platform and uh, nobody knew it because they're all praying so everybody looks up and the priest is going and my <laughs> my dad goes 
he's risen. And, my, and the priest said, no, he's fallen somewhere. <laughs> he's fallen. Could, uh, does anybody? <laughs> so, yeah, they looked around, finally found me. And uh, you I flipped was, onto yeah, the oh, Yeah, oh. I was under the thing, yeah. Oh my God. So uh, I could have been still there, you know. So, so doing pratfalls from the very beginning. Though. Right away, I was into that. Yeah, I love it. No problem. We, we added a piece in there that needed to be in there. Um, it was a Sermon on the Mount, and I, as I was walking up the mountain side, uh, there were about 250 extras. Got to the top and looked down about I don't know 125 yards. Mel's in a tent and it's raining, and you hear the thunder rolling and I thought it, it got really quiet like a, a eerie silence and I said I'm gonna get I knew it I said I'm gonna get struck by lightning and sure enough I felt as though somebody took their hands and slapped them against my ears and I uh, saw what appeared to me was like a pink static color for about seven eight seconds but the moment it hit I heard um, people uh, scream and a couple guys before me grabbed the ground and what they saw was like fire coming out of the right and left side of my head um, and I looked like I went to see Don King's hairstylist <laughs> he, obviously you hear Mel screaming out what happened to my Jesus <laughs> well, I read a recent interview where you said you're enjoying acting now why only now why did it take this long well I've always enjoyed it but uh now I have a sense of humor about it. Now I don't <laughs> take myself seriously in it as I used to. Uh, when you're younger, you take everything mm -hmm. a little too seriously. <laughs> so I'm glad I'm not young anymore. Um, and everything matters, you know, it's all mm -hmm. so important. Now I look at it all, but it's not important at all. Because mm. um, in the great context of life, what is, why are we all here? What are we all doing? Mm -hmm. So now I can look at it as a slight tongue-in-cheek act of absurdity, really, because <laughs> acting is, Kind of ridiculous, but I enjoy it because but it's a game. That moral center is so strong here in the redemptive nature of this character. Yes. Talk to me about that, um, and did that attract you to this uh, work? Completely. Victor Hugo talks of his, not of a transformation for Jean Valjean, but a, he calls it a transfiguration, oh, which wow. has a kind of spiritual overtone to it, in that mm -hmm. he's changed not just, not only from the prisoner to the mayor and becomes a good guy, inside his heart is completely opened up. He's completely changed and he's closer to God in every way. And I've always loved the last line of the musical. I was just about to mention that. I've never heard it for some reason. I don't know. I don't think I have either, but to love another person is to see the face of God. And it's so true. It's probably the example of, of Jesus in the Bible too. His life was not chronicled by going to churches or synagogues, it was about being with people or everyone. And that's sort of what Victor Hugo is talking about. And to me, it's the, one of the most exciting things about this. I mean, there's a, there's a depth in your performance here that is just extraordinary. Thanks. Now, do you hear what they're saying out there? No. Do, do like, you hear like, the people <laughs> say Academy Awards for Hugh Jackman? <laughs> Does that, do you hear that? You hear the buzz, Hugh. Well, you've got to make lyrics rhyme at least. Well, I, I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> do you hear the Academy bring, yeah. bringing awards to Hugh Jackman? Huh? It's close enough. It's close it's enough. Not too bad. I really have to thank all of you, our World Over family, for celebrating the last 17 years with us, and we'll continue to make more memories with you in the years to come. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. By the way, if you sign up for my free e-blast at RaymondArroyo.com, I'll send you some of the pieces I referenced earlier in the show and some exclusive content. In the meantime, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. See you next time. Bye now.